Okay, please uh, please state your name. My name is Trooper Harold S. Cole. Well, Trooper Cole, uh, it's so good to have you here with us today. I noticed you're wearing a uniform. What, what's the significance of that uniform? This uniform that I'm wearing today is a chapter uniform. Uh, we are we belong to the 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association, which issued a charter to the Greater Las Vegas Area chapter in 2005. And each chapter has their own uniform. And uh, this uniform is the one that the Greater Las Vegas Area chapter chose for their troopers to wear. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, I noticed you keep using the term trooper. Uh, and could you just share with us what what that term refers to? In the 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association, we have uh, field grade officers, we have high grade enlisted men, and instead of calling them by the rank, everybody in the 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association is a trooper. A trooper is a cavalryman. Okay. Now, uh, I know, know that you served uh, in the military, uh, uh, and we're going to hear your story, but first uh, I'd like uh, for you to introduce a colleague of yours who came in uh, a little bit before you came into the military. A colleague that you want me to introduce is a very good friend of mine. His name is Trooper Floyd L. Brown, and he came into the Second Cavalry Division. That's in the tenth cavalry. Okay. Tenth. He's been the tenth cavalry, but tenth cavalry was in the second cavalry division. Uh, his name is Trooper Floyd L. Brown. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Five, four, three, two, one. You're on. Uh, please, please state your, please state your name. I'm Trooper Floyd L. Brown. And. Uh, Trooper Brown, would you explain to us uh, you know, when you served in the military? I served in the military from 1936 to 1944. I was in the 10th Cavalry first. Graduated from high school on a Friday, on a Monday morning. Going to the 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers, Fort mm -hmm. Leavenworth, Kansas. And let me ask you a question now. Uh, why did you join? Because I joined the Army because there were no jobs. And this was in what year now? 1936. 1936. And how did you know about the, uh, the 10th Cavalry? I had a cousin who was my idol. He had been in service for a few years. Whenever he'd come around, he looked sharp in his uniform. Nice little Ford for three hundred dollars. He was in there, so I said, well, "I'm going to join the army because there's no jobs." Mm -hmm. And so you went right out of high school. Right. Yeah. I wasn't able to go to college. My mother wanted me to go, but I wasn't able to go, so I chose the army. Okay. So uh, tell us where you were living at the time, uh, and then going from there, tell us about the, uh, your first assignment in the military. I was living in Atchison, Kansas. And I joined the Army. At that time, they weren't taking a lot of people in the Army. But I got in on my first try. Mm -hmm. My mother signed for me, in fact. Yeah, how old were you at the time? <laughs> Good question. I had to be 16 or 17 or something. Mm -hmm. I don't remember now. It's been so long ago. Okay, so your, your mother signed for you, and uh, what was your first assignment? Headquarters Troop, 10th Cavalry. Okay, tell us about the early days in the military and what kind of training and how you liked it. It was during the peacetime when I was in. There was a difference between peacetime and wartime, as I see it. Everything was just normal. You did your training on horses, your rifle training, gun training, marching. It, it was nice. I liked it. Mm -hmm. I liked it. So how'd they treat you? 
me they treated fine because I was a person that was on the left, had a level head. I didn't take a lot of scuff, as you call it. But at the same time, it, it was nice. It was peacetime. Mm -hmm. So you had nothing to worry about then. Later on, I guess, you know, they had a few problems. Right. And so uh, in your first assignment, uh, tell us about the uh, the living conditions and the food and and uh, how much money you, you were making. The living condition was good. You had barracks. Food was good. My first job in the service was an army or assistant to the first sergeant in the office. And then I went into cooking. And then the sergeant uh, that was in charge of the mess hall sent me down to Fort Riley to be in C school, they get good school. Mm -hmm. I completed that, came back to the 10th Cavalry, and later on, I don't know the exact date, then I went to the 7th Corps in Fort Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. There, it was a detachment of us, I think about 12 or 14 soldiers. We were called strikers. Strikers worked for the officers on the base. That's all we did. I used to chauffeur for a Colonel Teeter and did things around the house and all of this, take his wife to the store and all of this. You know. And we didn't work all day. When you got through, we were just around the barracks. Mm -hmm. Go to town when it got ready. Well, being in the uh, 10th Cavalry at the time, uh, did you hear uh, any of, of the 10th Cavalry's history? Did anybody talk much about the, the 10th Cavalry and what they used to do? And the guys didn't talk about that. You, you just shoot the, shot the bull, and, you know, whatever, because there's nothing to talk about. There was mm -hmm. no war at that time. Right. And that made a difference. Uh, I've known where a soldier was going to retire back then when we made $21 a month. And if the soldier's going to retire, someone like a sergeant or whatever, he would take their stripes for 30 days. And he'd retire. Now, what kind of retirement he got, I don't know. It mm -hmm. couldn't have been much. But that's what they used to do. But evidently, they cut that out a long time ago. Right. So you said you made $21 a month. Uh, how did they pay you? Did they send it to your bank? Or? No, they didn't. We used to go down to the bank in a wagon, so to speak, with a horse drawn wagon, with the troopers on the side with the rifles. Get the money out of the bank, cash money, come back to the barracks, and then they had the tables and everything set up. They, the first sergeant's clerk would call the name of all the troops and that troop. Give me cash money. Oh, uh, okay. Um. Now, what did you? Uh, what kind of recreation did you have uh, where you could use that money? What'd you do with the with the money? Whatever you want to do with it, just like you today, you get the money and go to a partying or whatever. Go to the PX, buy your supplies. Mm -hmm. uh, go downtown, have a drink or two. It's just an ordinary thing to do yeah. at that time. So how did the uh, how did the civilians treat the uh, the soldiers of the 10th Cavalry? Civilians treated them fine because at Fort Leavenworth, well, in parts of town it was all black. Well, it was mixed with white, but we had no problems. At least I I didn't see any. Hmm. Now was the uh, was the 10th Cavalry integrated or? No, sir. It's a black outfit. Okay, so explain had, to us about that. The only integration was the white officer in charge. You had your sergeant major, first sergeant, and at that time they didn't have people with grades. You might have one or two buck sergeants, mm -hmm. carpal, and then later on they called, uh, they had what they called the T carp with a T on the sleeve. Then they got rid of that later on. In the perk private first class. But, I mean, I loved Army. Because I had discipline by, before going in, so I had no problem. And we just worked as a unit. Mm -hmm. Rode the horses, 
and had your training, your drill team and all this, played football, basketball. So you were in for uh, six years? Well, I got out in 44. And so, uh, yeah, share with us, uh, you know, what you consider to be, you know, one of the uh, funniest or the most enjoyable times you had while you was in the military. Enjoyable time was playing basketball. And tell us a little bit about that, why that was so enjoyable. Because I liked it. I played it in high school. So when I went in the Army, to come back to the same town and play in front of the home folks, per se. And uh, we used to play baseball. We'd go down to Fort Riley and play baseball. And just different places in the country that they'd be invited to, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it was just, uh, to me, the Army was great. I had no problem. And so, what 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 kind of rank did you uh, did you earn while you was in the military? The highest rank was staff sergeant, but I acted first sergeant and Fort Crook with no grade. I was still staff sergeant, and it was it was nice. Yeah, it was nice. So, how did you know? How did one get promoted uh, in the military? At that time, they wasn't doing a lot of promotions. They were very scarce. Uh, I was up for first sergeant, and when I was interviewed, the colonel said, well, what makes a good first sergeant? I said, well, use good common sense. He said, well, that's about the best answer you can give. But I didn't get it, because it was a detachment, and uh, they weren't too particular about promoting anyway at that time. Well, later on, I guess, in the early 40s, after the 9th and 10th broke up in the cadres and whatever, they started promoting people. Mm -hmm. So when you got out in uh, 1942, uh, 44. What, uh, in 44, yeah, what, uh, you know, what prompted you to uh, get out? Well, yeah, I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. In fact, prior to that, I was still at Fort Crook, and I think in 1942, uh, order came out, a general order came out where anyone had been on a base over 18 months had to go be transferred. And there was a detachment with, with white in it, and we had three blacks in it. My friend, he was the first one to go, and he went down some town in Mississippi. And we'd correspond. He said, man, don't come down here. So when it come time to go for the other 12 that was left, I went, supply I always know where you're going. So I was pretty tight with the guys. So I went down there and said, I said, hey, Corporal, I said, where are these people going? He said, I can't tell you. I said, confidential, you can tell me, let it go. He said, well, there's 11 of you going to Mississippi, and one going to Aberdeen, Maryland, I said, thank you. But I know they wasn't gonna change, so by me being at that time the only black, I didn't think they were gonna take the 10 and one. So I went to Aberdeen, and I met up with a lot of, uh, a few of the 10th Cavalry people there. And when I got out, well, I broke my hand for playing baseball. Mm -hmm. I used that to get out. So they were sending them overseas like mad. And I just swore I wasn't going overseas. And I didn't go. Yeah. So in 44, uh, the war was still going on. Yes. And so what kind of work did you do as a civilian? After I got out? Yes. I was a chauffeur in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm hmm For doctors. And then when they called me back in, I went to Fort Crook. And Fort Crook is where? South of Omaha. It's out by the uh, Offit Field, what they call Offit Field, SAC base. Okay. The on the ground deal. Now was that an integrated unit or was that uh, an all black unit? It was a school. It was a big mechanic school where people from all over the country would come into this school. And uh, we had a black 
and you were still segregated with a few blacks and then the whites. But I used to show for with the uh, on, on the base there with the uh, hospital, you know, driving ambulance and all that, going out getting sold and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, and then after I went to Aberdeen and come back, then that was it. Then I did a lot of things since I've been out. Yeah. So as you reflect back, as you think back on your military experience, you know, what would you tell uh, young, a young person or any person who's, who's watching this and looking at you, what would you say about uh, serving in the military? I think every youngster coming up today should have some military experience. Of course, the military was strict in my day, but they had to lighten up, I think, in the later years. They didn't, they weren't as strict because they had so many people come in that weren't, uh, a lot of them weren't educated, so they had problems. But I think military service would do anybody a little good. It would make, make a man out of them. They'll think for themselves, try to do for themselves, and whatever. Okay. Well, Trooper Brown, we certainly appreciate you uh, taking this uh, interview. Uh, this will be in the archives at the Library of Congress. We thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, as you close your interview? Well, there's one thing I'd like to say. <clears throat> at Fort Crook, we had some white units there, which I was in charge of, supposed to be in charge of. And we get out on the field, I'd give an order, they wouldn't get take orders from me. So the little captain on the sideline, he had to come and take over because they wouldn't they wouldn't obey orders. Had it been a black outfit, they would take orders, they would have done something about it, but they didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. It was still kind of prejudiced back in right. the days. So what did the captain say? Uh, he just gave the order and they went on. Yeah. But did did, did the captain say anything to them about uh, you being their superior? And he did because I think some of them captains or lieutenants or whatever was kind of <laughs> right. They, they weren't they weren't too right either. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but other than that, I had no problems. That was the only thing. Yeah. I, one thing I was saying that the first time I seen black Marines could come to the school was in '42. The four black Marines came to go to the, it's big mechanic school, is what it was, armistice department. And that's the first time I've seen black in the Marines at that time mm -hmm. for the school. But other than that, I love the Army. Okay, well again, thank you so much for your service, and uh, this concludes the interview. Thank you. Five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. Uh, please state your name. Good morning, sir. My name is Trooper Harold Les Cole. I'm was born and raised in North Pelham, New York, and I joined the service in 1942. One of my biggest surprises was in joining the service was that in North Pelham, New York, we didn't have no integration. We all went the same way, whites and blacks, you never would know about it. But when I got to Whitehall Street in New York and joined the service, everything was fine. Whites and blacks, we all got on the same bus and trains and everything and went out to camp up to New York. When we got to camp up to New York, we did our, we picked up our uh, gear and uniforms and stuff and we ate in the same mess halls. But later that night, when we got ready to go to our billet area, we were segregated. That was a big blow to me in my life. And as I always said in life, as far as a black man is concerned, once you try to get him down, he will rise to higher lengths, higher peaks than he was before. He seems to, to have built in him this spirit that you're not going to keep me down. 
and all through life that's the way it's been. After I went through that, uh, they shipped me out to Fort Riley, Kansas. And could, could I interrupt you there and, and go back and ask you now uh, why you uh, joined the military? I joined the military in 1938, 39, 40, and 41. The Germans were sinking ships in the Atlantic Ocean like crazy. And so when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941, every brother of American wanted to get into the military, fight for their country. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those persons. Okay. And so were you drafted or did you I volunteer? volunteered. Okay. I what, did, what, did your, what did your parents think about you volunteering? Well, being that I was so young, I had to give my parents permission to go into the service. So uh, there was about three of us out of high school that went, went in the service together there. We all went into the cavalry. And uh, like I said before, mm -hmm. when we got to Fort Riley, they just turned around and shipped us down to Fort Clark, Texas. I was assigned to, the, to Troop F, the 9th Cavalry, which was part of the 2nd Cavalry Division. And when I was, when we got in Texas, uh, as far as life in the military was concerned for me, it was uh, something new and some something that really electrified me because of how everybody got together and did these things, marching and eating and everything was by the numbers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, really, uh, I had a problem with people directing me where to go, when to sleep, when to eat, and all this. This was a big problem to me at that time. Well, so, tell us about your, uh, you know, your nine commission officers and and the people who were over you. Uh, when we got in, non commissioned officers were, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in, in the in the in the black units, we were all black units because we were segregated and as far as the non-commissioned officers was concerned, uh, I guess they were the same as any non-commissioned officer in any outfit, white, black, pink, blue, or whatever. They were soldiers in the first place. Mostly non-commissioned officers are really good soldiers. They don't pick non-commissioned officers that are not soldiers, you know, only in headquarters where they have clerks and stuff like that that they need. But out in the field, non-commissioned officers are, are very good to the troopers. And in the cavalry, they were excellent. And were they were they black as well? They were black. Mm -hmm. And the, the white officers that I found while I was in the military, uh, the southern officers were better than the northern officers. I wanted to know why because I was born and raised with white officers, you know, we went to school together and everything. And I wanted to know why they they treated the black soldiers uh, a little worse than the southern officers did. And I came to the conclusion that the southern officers were used to being around black people and they knew how to treat them where this brand new power that these white officers, young white officers, I may, I would like to say, young white officers had accumulated this power of being over somebody and directing them, and they just didn't know how to handle it. That's the conclusion mm -hmm. I came to. As far as that, there wasn't a lot of them. There was just, these were just a few and far in between. And, uh, Generally, the officers in the cavalry were very good, very excellent officers. And uh, as I was coming in, we did find that we had uh, a few black young officers coming aboard too. They were excellent. I, I have to say that. The young black officers were very good. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, explain to us what, uh, what kind of training 
uh, you had in the military and, and what was your, your main job? Well, the, at the beginning the training was basically the same as all military people get except we had horses. Uh, we uh, got up in the morning and we did our calisthenics and stuff like that and come back and you know every uh, they teach you personal hygiene and you have personal hygiene classes, how to treat you, yourself, your horses, how to treat your weapons and everything, how to clean up. You got to keep your area spick and span in the military. is very good. That is excellent training for a young man like myself coming into to the service. And uh, I, uh, the, the basic training was fine and then they let us they told us about the horses and they gave us a halter and told us to go out in the crowd and get an officer, get a horse. That was your horse for as long as you was there. And mm -hmm. you get to name them and everything. So, uh... Had you been around horses before? I've been around horses since I was six years old. I was riding since I was about six. My brother worked at a ride, my older brother worked at a riding academy in, in uh, Hutchison Field in, in uh, North Bellum, New York. and. We used to go there to take the horses to the water, and uh, when I was younger, I could only ride one horse and, and uh, take it to the water and trough, bring it back. But later, I was able to lead three or four horses when I got older. Mm -hmm. But I've been riding horses, and the significant of this is, when I got out of the service, I've never been on a horse since. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? I haven't the slightest idea yeah. of why I never rode. They always used to ask me, come on, let's go riding. I never went riding again. I guess I had more different priorities after I got out of the service uh, than I did before I went into service. See, at, uh, we didn't have uh, all the electronic stuff and things that they have nowadays. But even back there when I came out of the service, they had more things. Television was coming in and stuff. And they had more things to do than they did before. We lived off the land be before I went into service. You know, we did our own garden, we picked our own fruit and stuff, and we cooked it and ate it. We uh, uh, chopped trees for wood and stuff in the house and everything. Mm -hmm. So we did everything basically by ourselves. We lived off the land. And now, even today, this is 2007, people don't even believe things that we did then. You know, but uh, as far as training is concerned, then after we did our basic training, we got our horses, then we, they went into different series training, see, because it was wartime. And in wartime, the, the, the main object was to train us for combat. And uh, we went to ABC series, D series training. We went on maneuvers, and after maneuvers, we came back and we had more training. Uh, you know, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, uh, reading maps, uh, taking squads out and uh, giving them a, an object or, or a problem to, to solve. And then they had another squad to come along and, and, and stop you from doing it. You know, to try to capture you, and so. Uh, uh, these are the type of things we did when we were training. Firing all kind of weapons, uh, using a machete, firing uh, pistols, rifles, machine guns, mm -hmm. and... Uh, well, were you, were you trained to be a infantry soldier or artillery? We trained cavalry. We did this cavalry. on foot and on horse. We, we shot rifles and stuff while we were mounted and everything, rifles and pistols. Swords. Uh, well, it sounds like it was safe. fun. Was it as fun? <laughs> it was as much fun as it sounds. Well, training was was very rigid at that time because what they did, they had a time span and how to get you ready. And uh, I'd like to take a break right now. Sure. So, combat training was very good, and it also seemed to before. We went into training. We had a lot of people from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and stuff 
coming in the cavalry because, like I said before, it was wartime, and they, they were drafting these, these people in because we were forming a division. Uh -huh. And like all black division, it wasn't like you could mix it up and you didn't. Have, but it was kind of hard uh, getting uh, qualified men into into the wartime army. So we had a lot of people from Illinois, Chicago, New York coming in, and there was always this, this, this dissension between the troops, you know, where you're from and everything. I, I uh, had a problem with every time uh, I would run into somebody new and we'd sit around talking, they asked me where I was from, and I would tell them I was from New York. And this seemed to, to make them less interested in what I would do who I was, and then they, on the side, they was talking about, yeah, okay, he's from New York. So I'd come up to, I was talking to one of the guys from New York, and I said, how come every time we tell these guys we're from New York, they have a couple They don't like no people from New York. So I said, well, I'm going to tell them I'm from Alabama. <laughs> so they asked me where I was from, I tell them I'm from Alabama. I didn't have no problem. <laughs> no so that's how things went, but like I wanted, they the point I wanted to get They didn't question to, your, uh, no, your Accent no, or lack thereof. They, they, they never did none of that. Now, what, what, the point is that I'm getting to is that as we went through all this training, and we came back and we got through combat training, and just before we went on maneuvers, we were such a tight knitted group, all of us, that you couldn't say nothing to nobody about a cavalryman. You know, nowhere where he came from. You know, and uh, I, I really like that. We were really gelled together and we was a real crack combat outfit. Mm -hmm. Now did you stay in contact with any of the people that was in your uh, you know in your troop? Well I, I'll give you a little for instance in, in 1993 I formed a chapter in Los, in Los Angeles and in my chapter there were five members of the chapter that was from Troop F 9th Cavalry and I didn't know neither one of them, they didn't know each other, we didn't know each other, five of us. Huh. From Troop F to 9th Cavalry, we didn't know each other, so. So how, how many how many uh, men were in Troop F? Well, we would figure like uh, eight men in the squad, four squads in the, in the platoon. And we had the first, second, third, and machine gun platoon. So, you can give it. See, years ago, when in 1866, when they formed the <coughs> regiments and the troops, <coughs> maybe they have 30, 40, 50 men in the company, mm -hmm. and that was it. <coughs> so when they talk about Troop F went this place in history books and stuff, you have to understand <coughs> that these were nothing but like detachments of, 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 of troopers going to do this job at this place. Uh, 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 a modern military man would think maybe you got 200 people out there, you know, when you're sending the troop out. This is what the troop is concerned, the companies are concerned of now. They're about 200 men, I guess. And uh, back then, when they were forming regiments in 1866, this is what they had. This is what this is what the company was, was 50 or 60 men. Yeah. Well, when you first went in back in, uh, in 1942, uh, was there much talk about the history of the uh, Buffalo Soldiers? Uh, did you hear any uh, any of that kind of talk? Uh, as far as the Buffalo Soldiers was concerned, as far as in, in 1944 in the military, there was no his, there was nobody talking about the history of the Buffalo Soldiers as far as I was concerned in the military. Nobody was talking mm -hmm. about it. Not even the people that were there. But what happened is that in 1941 in Camp Funston, uh, Kansas, they put out a pictorial history of the Second Cavalry Division, which was commanded by General B. O. Davis and the uh, senior. And the general in 1936, General B. O. Davis Jr. graduated from West Point. The first. Uh, black graduate of West Point in the 18th century, in the 19th century, and he wanted to go to the to the Air Force, and the military didn't have no black people in the Air Force. Well, it wasn't called the Air Force; it was called the Army Air Corps. 
and they didn't have no blacks in there, so he had to go to the cavalry unit where the blacks were, and he was his father's attachment. And that, that's uh, until 1936 when uh, Eleanor Roosevelt got them to open up Tuskegee Airmen for him, and then he, was, he shipped out of the cavalry and went into to form the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. He learned well, to fly, I should put it that way. Well, what was the, uh, how would you characterize the, uh, you know, the morale, the esprit de corps of the, of the men in your... Excellent. Excellent. We were very good. How did it compare yeah. to, uh, uh, you know, to the white units? Uh, well, really, uh, we, uh, when, in wartime, when we occupied a base, it, it was all black except for hospital people and administrative people, which was on uh, the main part of the base, which was called base headquarters. And uh, this is, there was no comparison with a combat outfit and a service unit. See, the base, everybody in base headquarters, the two hospitals, this is a, like a service unit and they, they don't do no combat training. Like and uh, really, uh, we, uh, took over the bases. Every place we were at, we took over the bases except for the second grade apartment. We couldn't go to the base movie, stuff like that. We had, uh, if new weapons came out, we didn't get them to like next week sometime, so mm -hmm. hypothetically. And uh, <coughs> As far as rations is concerned, I would, being that I'm not a, a C2, a S2 man, I think that's S2 as rations, is that I didn't know what they were given, no place, you know, all I knew was that what we were getting in the mess of, and mm -hmm. the food was all right. right. Because the carrymen had cooks that were excellent cooks, and they prepared the food just like they were preparing the food at home. And you marched into the mess hall, and you stood at a table, and you didn't sit down until eight men was at that table. Pardon me, back up. You didn't sit down until the whole troop was in the mess hall. The whole troop, everybody was standing at the table, and then they let you sit down after they uh, rest the food. They let you sit down. And you never even touched the food. The food was on the table just like it was, it was at home. And you didn't touch the food until they told you you could eat. Now, if you wasn't fast, you didn't get nothing. So, so who put that food out there? Who, who, the, the mess, the, the 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 people that run the mess hall. Like you know, they had people in the mess hall. That, they didn't believe in the buffet style. Well, later on, that did, that did come into effect. We only ate that way for my first part in the service because, like I said, we had different training, different periods of training, mm -hmm. and doing basic training. That's the way we ate doing basic training. But after that. They issued us those mess kits and stuff. Right. <laughs> so, now, uh, but, but first, but first, before they gave you that mess kit, you had a, a steel tray. You know, you walk in the mess hall, you pick up a steel tray, and, and you go through the line. That was after basic training. Then we didn't have all that nice eating and standing at the table and everything. We just picked up our tray and we went to the table and started eating. And, uh, then we got the mess kits, and uh, they, we used to have to bring them to the mess hall because they had the big pots outside where they wash them. They want, this is a part of training. This mm -hmm. is why you was eating there, because they wanted you to walk, learn how to wash your mess kits so you don't get diarrhea or nothing like that, leaving the food in there and stuff. And the sergeant would expect, inspect your stuff, your gear, and see that everything was all right. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, you know, it was common that uh, the black troops got the uh, didn't get as good equipment as the uh, white troops. Uh, was there any resentment uh, about that kind of uh, disparity? Well, like one piece of weapon would be the six shooter and the forty-five automatic. See, we didn't get the forty-five automatics until about maybe two years after that. We was always using the six shooter all the time, the pistol. And uh, we didn't get the carbines for, we was using the old three. 
before the M1s come in. The M1s have been, been in since before I went into service, and we didn't get them until a couple of years later. And uh, uh, I can't say nothing about the animals, because the animals were... We broke some of the animals down in Browning, Brownsville, Texas. We went down there to break them in. And when they would ship the animals in, uh, they would come in by the train loads. And like we may have 500,000 animals coming in at one time, you know. And we had stables as far as you can see. I mean, as far as, if this land was flat, as far as you could see, that's what stables for the 2nd Cavalry Division. And it was amazing, and then they had uh, uh, stable sergeants for every company, every troop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to go to the stables 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, clean the stables before we went to eat. Uh, you, you had to, all sick horses was on picket line, six bay, you, your horse was on sick line, you had to go to the other side of the stables and get a good horse. And, uh, this bothered a lot of people all the time. They didn't like riding nobody's horse but their own. But if your horse got sick, they were very strict about the horses. Very, very mm -hmm. strict. Stable sergeant was like a general. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so if, if uh, something bad happened to your horse, they broke a leg or something, did you get court-martialed? or No. You can't get caught martial for a horse running into a ditch or something because you got no control over it. You don't know the ditch is there. And the horse didn't know it was there, else he wouldn't run in it. Yeah. But the horse was pretty good about where they set their feet. The cavalry horse was pretty smart. You was pretty safe on the cavalry horse. Uh, we didn't hear nothing too much about broken legs or nothing. Mm -hmm. The sick horse would get saddle sores, something like that. And that would be uh, uh, an area to discipline a trooper because it comes to about how you, how you saddle in the horse and how you sit in the horse for the horse to get saddle sores. But uh, nobody never got disciplined for it. I guess they just did retraining. Mm -hmm. You know, they retrained you. And uh, after a while, you know, everybody didn't, didn't make it in the cavalry riding. They never got rid of them because there was other areas they could they could put them in, you know. Right. Uh, now, as you uh, as you continued on with uh, with this unit, uh, did you go overseas or? The Second Cavalry Division was shipped overseas in 1940, in the 1944. We went to North Africa, and when we got there, this is my second trauma in the military. They disbanded us in a combat zone with a, with a top combat outfit. That's because the white man did not want the black man fighting his war. But after a while he couldn't help it because there were so many black outfits, combat outfits in the service at that time. We had the 92nd and 93rd, we had the 24th and 25th, we had the 9th and 10th, we had the 27th and 28th cavalry. See, during the war, they formed two more cavalry units, the 27th and the 28th cavalry units. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when we was down when we was down in Texas, we also, after training while we was waiting to ship overseas, we also patrolled the border. The experienced troops patrolled the border while we was in training. Uh, they had the 10th cavalry in California and they had the 9th cavalry in Jacksonville, Texas. And we patrolled the border because they thought that the Japanese was going to come in through Mexico. Well, that's probably information that a whole lot of people didn't know about uh, yeah. the patrolling the border. The border. Well, the, the, the 9th and 10th Cavalry patrolled the border in the, second, in the First World War, too. So they had the duty of both wars. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and so going back now to uh, North Africa, you said they disbanded? Yes, the they disbanded division. the 2nd Cavalry Division. In, in North Africa. And so what they made service troops out of us. Okay. They gave us a chance, they gave they gave us the option of volunteering to go into a combat unit like the ninety second came over after we did and uh, they asked us that we want to volunteer for the ninety second. And uh, there was a bunch of troopers that 
went into 92nd, but by the time 92nd got there, we was in service troops and we were we were doing patrol units at night in in uh, Palermo and Maples. Of course, the Germans was coming in from shore wherever they were staying, and they were coming in to raid for food and stuff. And this is a job that I would say umpteen outfits had to patrol at night mm -hmm. to try to catch them. And I, I don't remember, never remember nobody catching them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were cool. They were now, cool. during the time that you were in North Africa, uh, was this about the same time that uh, George Patton was in North Africa? Patton was with the, with the, with the tank outfit. Right. That was farther. See, we was in Oran, so he was out near Egypt, a little farther, I would say, east. And uh, they were, they ain't gone by the time we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so how did you, uh, how did you all keep abreast of the war? Uh, since you didn't have television and I don't know how we had, how many radios you we had. We had a newspaper. We we had we had the armed forces radio station there, and we had also had the Stars and Stripes, which was our our way of finding out what was going on. It's kind of late, but we 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 uh, by word of mouth we knew much about what was going on. You know, uh, the scuttlebug gets around quick. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. It's, Ninety percent of it is false, but the other ten percent you can count, you can count on. on it. So, how long did you stay in uh, North Africa? We wasn't in North Africa long. We, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little story about North Africa. When we landed in North Africa, first sergeant told me on the ship. He said, "Cole, take your platoon and go up there." I think they called the line out. So. I went up there and I come to find out the whole company was going, the whole troop was going up there. So when we got up there, the first sergeant says, okay, let's dig a foxhole because we're going to be here for a while. Everybody started complaining because we was up on this mountain and it was nothing but rock, you know. All we had was this shovel. We didn't have no picks or nothing. The only thing we had our ban a bayonet we could cut into. But everybody was complaining, and like when night fell, nobody had, very few people had a foxhole. Jerry come over at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he stopped laying down the bombs. <laughs> and when it got light, about 6, I turned around, man, including me, everybody had a foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my first experiences in war there. It shows you what you can do. Under first conditions, right. if you want. Yeah, I had to tell that because that really tickled me at that time. But uh, we didn't stay in North Africa long. We went over to Sicily. We were following the front line. That's what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went over to Sicily. We stayed there for about a month or so, and then we went over to Italy. We went so, to Italy because they was fighting in Anzio. Right. And they were like killing people like flies over there. They was killing. They had. Germans had one of these big uh, artillery pieces on the railroad. Mm -hmm. He just he tore he tore Uncle Sam up out there in Anzio. And finally we got past that and there was uh, they went up to Leghorn. When they got up to Leghorn, they uh, they pulled the white troops out and that's when they put the ninety second up there. Ninety second up there they froze and being that they wasn't, they didn't, they wasn't an experienced combat group, uh, and they, a lot of the guys got killed up there. Didn't mm -hmm. have to die, but this is war. So my philosophy is, all this happened in war. I wouldn't think that this was the first outfit that wasn't conditioned to fight in this con in, in in this territory, this terrain, or anything, but. I uh, get a lot of feedback because they were black. They stuck them up there. I was the same opinion. I'm the same opinion because they had white troops up there. Why didn't they leave them up there? Mm -hmm. They pulled them back out and they were going into the invasion of southern France. Well, me, I was lucky. I got on 
they put me on a ship going on an invasion of southern France with them. So, but the invasion of southern France was like uh, no resistance, man, you know, it was just like going through nothing, you know. So we was there on the shore about a week. And we went in and maybe about 10 miles and they told us to come back, we're going to get on the ship and go back to That's what we did, we got on the ship and come back. By the time we got together, going to Corsica and Sardinia and Sicily and Italy, we shipped back to southern France and they put us on a, uh, a train and shipped us up to Carentown, France. We sat up there doing all type of duties and stuff. The guys, the, the white unit moved out and the old man, we had a, a captain, his name was Shelby, and he was from Shelby, Mississippi. Not Shelby, not Mississippi. I think it was Shelby, North Carolina, South Carolina. Anyway, he was a really hardcore redneck. But one thing I can say about him, he was a fair man. He was good, he was fair. He called me one day and he says, Sergeant Cole, he says, I see you by your records that you operate a 35 mil mood projector. I said, yeah, I, would. I did that. I trained for that. He says, well, we got a theater downtown. He says, I want you to go down there and run it. So I says, okay. He says, you're going to take two men down there, and he says, you can pick whoever you want. So I picked the guys to go with me. We went downtown, and we run that theater down there. Of course, the war was almost over. But the guy that run the theater before I was there, he was a master sergeant. So a couple of days I came up to the, the old man's office and I says, you know, I says, the guy that ran that theater down there, he was a master sergeant. I says, how come you just putting the staff sergeant down there? <laughs> so he says, Cole. You're a master sergeant now. He says, I'll get the paperwork out. He says, you're a master sergeant. But see, he, the paperwork never finalized. But I did, I went down there as a master sergeant. Did the pay catch up with that? No paperwork don't catch. You don't get no paperwork, you don't get no you pay. You don't get no pay, yeah. So speaking of pay, how much were you paid when you was in the war? Fifty-one the first day before. Fifty-one dollars a month when I first went in. Was that a lot of money? Well, yeah, because uh, we didn't have to pay for anything. I sent most of my money home, you know, but uh, uh, the paymaster would be sitting at a table like I'm sitting at now, and he, they would pay you in cash, brand new money. Every payday, you get paid in cash, brand new money. And there were two, three tables down there, one for for what you owe. You, know, you had to pay for your laundry. <laughs> you had to pay for about two or three tables <coughs> down the line, and they would get that before you left. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you got, after you got all your money that you, see, even if you had him for an allotment, you didn't get that money because they sent an allotment home to you. But uh, after that, you had some of the biggest crap games and card games. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I'd heard yeah. that there were Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. I mean, they were deadly, too. I mean, guys would get killed playing there on payday. They would get killed for people trying to cheat and stuff like that. And uh, people would be in town, you know, whiskey be flowing downtown. The reason uh, you can understand that the military man didn't have to pay for nothing. You know, he, 30 days a month, he had free food, free clothes, he paid for his laundry, he paid for everything over there that he needs. And uh, the only thing he had to watch out was for his uh, personal hygiene, uh, toothpaste and stuff like that. See, he had to buy that out of that money. And uh, that's the only thing he had to worry about. So you can see why he would gamble and, and go to town for a couple of how many days that money would last him. Because after around, you come around the 10th of the month, man, and they ain't nobody had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nobody had a penny, and uh, they'd be doing a lot of borrowing. On the 
pay line, you would see all these guys that would loan people money standing there collecting their money. But the, the military frowned on loaning people money too. Mm -hmm. You know, because they called them guys loan sharks. And they did because well, they, they probably got they, they probably give got you a, a dollar, interest. they give you a dollar, you pay them back too. That that's the way they did. You want mm -hmm. ten dollars, you pay back twenty. So the military frowned on that. Yeah. Well, Trooper Cole, we're down now to uh, you know about five minutes, uh, and I want to give you the opportunity to uh, you know to say to you know whatever view and audience that may be looking at your interview, you know what how how would you uh, characterize your service you know, in the United States uh, Army? Well, really, my service in the military was. I'm, I'm a lifer. I did 20 years, so I did uh, four years in the Army and 16 years in the Air Force. So how I got to get into the Air Force was I was standing out in the field, knee deep in mud and dust blowing in my face and it was night and I had my mess kid out there trying to find out what kind of food they were putting in it. and. Uh, I looked over my shoulder and right across the street, lights there, these guys were sleeping in bags and they had sheets and everything, you know. So I was getting ready to get discharged and I said, that's where I'm going. So I went over to the Air Force and that was probably one of the best moves I made in my life. I was very lucky I'm doing things like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went into the Air Force. and. Uh, I think that uh, the question that you asked was that how did I value my military life and stuff and I think that it was excellent. Uh, I'm still a military man. My wife sitting in the back and she can tell you that. I'm still the same way. I like everything neat in order and I like things to be done right away not to wait to be doing them next week or stuff. I don't like for stuff to pile up. And I'm still military inside. And uh, I think that every young man should have some type of military training. He don't have to be in the service, but there's academies or schools and stuff that, ROTCs and stuff that they can learn this training from to, to uh, teach him how to respect and, and not just people, but things, life itself, things that they do in life to respect it and, and to cherish it. These things are not given to you. You know, you have to earn them. So this is my opinion about life and things in the military. Okay, now I'm going to ask you uh, to. Uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, to make whatever statement you want to make about the value of military service to democracy, to as as Americans understand and and know democracy? Uh, well, as far as democracy is concerned, it's being threatened all over the world. It has been even probably before I was born. And uh, I think that we do have to have some type of security force to protect that democracy because as an example, if you had four pieces of chicken sitting over there that you sitting there eating and all these ten people in the place are hungry, they're eventually going to try to get that chicken you got. So, being that we are one of the richest countries in the world, and uh, I would say even the rest of the countries that are pretty well off in the world, people are striving to get to them or get what they got, or try to undermine them, try to undermine their system, try to uh, brainwash their people. And this is one reason why we need to have what we have in uh, our security as far as military or civilian is concerned. We, both, we need both elements to keep our country safe and to keep our people safe. And uh, 
I have a lot of complaints about this country because I'm a black man. And uh, I would venture to say that there's a whole lot of people that have complaints and I'm not by myself. And uh, I think that we should try to uh, iron out all these complaints we got because we have we're educated enough, we have enough resources, and we should be able to handle all these things so we don't have these prejudices amongst us. I'm not uh, so naive to know that we're not going to have no prejudices, but we're going to have them, but we should try to solve the ones that we can. Right. Well, Trooper Cole, I want to thank you so much for your service. I thank you for giving this interview uh, and giving your, your information to the Library of Congress. Thank um, you. Sir.